Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Gam with Yahoo Finance, and I'm joined now by Heath Tarbert, the chairman of the CFTC. Heath, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. So we're going to talk a lot about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and really nerd out on this topic, so I hope the audience is prepared for that. In 2018, Yahoo Finance interviewed Bill Hinman from the Securities and Exchange Commission at our All Markets Summit out in San Francisco. And at that time last year, he clarified the SEC's stance on Bitcoin and Ether, saying that neither were security. And I just want you to clarify the CFTC's stance on Bitcoin and Ether. Sure, sure, happy to do that. And, but before I do it, I think one of the things I'd like to say, because I haven't, this is, I think my first big public appearance as chairman, is I wanted to stress the importance of blockchain and, and, and digital assets uh, to the United States. And in particular, as, as CFTC chairman, I really want the US to lead in this technology. I don't want another country to lead. I want the United States to lead, because whoever leads in this technology is gonna end up writing the rules of the game. So then we come to the question, well, what is the role of the CFTC? Um, and it's very interesting because I think the CFTC's role is to ensure there's integrity in the markets. Uh, and we want these markets to develop in, in a way that has integrity. So under the Commodity Exchange Act, we regulate commodities. A commodity is a very broad definition. I'm not going to give it to you now, but essentially, if you have to say that a movie ticket is not a commodity, which is in our statute, it covers a lot of financial contracts. If it's a security, it gets kicked out. So to your question, Scott, we've been very clear on, 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 on Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a commodity under the Commodity Exchange Act. We haven't said anything about Ether until now. Uh, it is my view as chairman of the CFTC that Ether is a commodity, and therefore it will be regulated under the CEA. And my guess is that you will see in the near future uh, Ether-related futures contracts and other uh, derivatives potentially traded. So you're hearing this all for the first time. This is first on Yahoo Finance. Breaking news. Breaking news. Uh, it's my conclusion personally, uh, as, but as chairman of the CFTC, that Ether is a commodity and therefore would fall under our jurisdiction. Why a commodity, though? So the commodity definition is very broad, as I, as I mentioned. And, and the way that it works is most things are commodities, particularly financial contracts or stores of value. Securities are commodities, but they're kicked out of the way the statute works, and the SEC regulates those. So it's, as long as it's not a security, it, it basically falls within the definition of a commodity. And I would encourage all of you, to the extent you have time, the SEC has gone through and essentially uh, laid out an analysis of when a crypto asset is a security or not. Um, so it's a very interesting test, but essentially, if it's being used as an investment and you're making an investment in a crypto asset and that crypto asset um, is a common enterprise and you think you're gonna derive profits from the work of others, uh, as opposed to the intangible value of the crypto asset itself, then it's more likely to be a security. This is the Howey test from 1946. It was a landmark SEC case that kind of determined the framework for what a security is. But we should just point out, Ether is the second largest cryptocurrency. It's got a market cap of about $20 billion. Bitcoin is obviously the most valuable cryptocurrency with a market cap of $150 billion. You mentioned the possibility of Ether derivatives, Ether futures. Do you think that happens this year? I think it's entirely possible. I and mean, we've got a few months left in this year, so I would say within the next 12 months, I think you could absolutely see that, maybe even sooner than 12 months. Would there be enough demand for Ether futures? It's a great question. Uh, I think we're going to let the markets decide that, but I definitely think there's interest in our regulated platforms in, in, uh, in, in trying it out. I mean, and when you look at the history of futures contracts and commodities, some of them have been trading over 100 years. The number two corn contract, for example, uh, and its predecessors have been around for a long time. So just because it doesn't necessarily uh, have a lot of open interest or demand immediately doesn't mean that it, that it won't. Well, and it's not like you're not experienced in this world. I mean, Bitcoin futures are a thing. How has that been going? Any takeaways as a regulator? No, it, it, it's been going well, and one of our things is to make sure that that market has integrity. I mean, our role as a regulator is to make sure that when you enter into a futures trade, uh, you can be sure that the markets are transparent, that the price you see for Bitcoin on the futures represents uh, all the demand and, and supply, at least that's available through a well-regulated, transparent exchange. 
And so we hope that's going to be the case for everything. And that's why we're seeing a lot of these products actually migrate to the federally regulated CFTC system because it's been around for all decades. And well, and, and there's a distinction between, in terms of your regulation, spot versus futures. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, so the CFTC is a financial regulator. We regulate derivatives. Uh, the, we regulate derivatives that are based upon underlying commodities, but we don't actually regulate the commodities themselves. Um, we regulate the derivatives, the futures, swaps, and options. However, if you think about it, if there's problems in the spot market, if there's manipulation and there's fraud, for example, that will affect the futures markets. It'll undermine the integrity of them. So the way Congress did it a long time ago is we essentially have regulatory authority over the derivatives markets, but we have fraud and manipulation enforcement authority in the spot markets. So we can actually go after actors in the spot markets that aren't regulated by the CFTC, that are trading in these types of assets that ultimately undermine what's going on in our markets. Your earlier point about classifying ether as a commodity, what does that mean for forked assets? And, and, and that defined simply is, is really the spin-offs of cryptocurrency yeah. like Bitcoin Cash, for example. Well, it stands to reason that similar assets should be treated similarly. So if a forked asset has been determined not to be a security and not to be, I'm sorry, if, if, a, if the underlying asset, the original asset, the original digital asset hasn't been determined to be a security and is therefore a commodity, most likely the forked asset will be the same unless the fork itself raises some of those issues under that classic Howey test that the Supreme Court articulated back in 1946. So I think if, you know, that is essentially the question. If the forked asset raises securities law issues, uh, then it has to undergo that analysis. But assuming the fork does not raise those issues, it's more likely to then be just like the asset from which it derives. And this might be more of a philosophical question, but do you think the Howey test, again, from 1946, applies to today's world? I mean, it was about a citrus farm. It seems a little bit bizarre to apply something that old to a digital asset. Yeah, I think, I think the analysis is pretty sound. It has stood the test of time because it's applied, as you say, the original test dealt with a citrus farm. It's been applied in all sorts of context. But I think ultimately it goes to that fundamental question. Is this something that's being used for capital raising? And are you investing in an enterprise? Or are you buying something that has sort of tangible store of value in and of itself? And so the investment contract analysis, I think the SEC has very thoughtfully outlined how the Howey test applies to today. But I I think the fundamental concept of what's an investment and therefore a security and what's something different is, is, is still a pretty good test. It stands the test of time. Uh, you must spend a lot of time reading about crypto. I mean, there's a lot in here. And I'm still very much learning. I'm still very much learning. But it is critical that our agency, given now that we've got these new markets, and for the first time in decades, we have new exchanges coming to us, new exchanges and clearinghouses that are focused on these kinds of assets. Uh, and so the agency is taking on, the, you, you know, regulating and supervising these new institutions. And we've got to make sure that we're up to speed. And that is absolutely critical. Well, and now, of course, you have Facebook trying to enter the fray with Libra. Are you involved in any of those discussions when it comes to either implementation of Libra or regulation? I think all, all the federal regulators now, as well as other parts of the US government, are studying Libra and seeking to understand sort of exactly how it works. And, and so we're undergoing sort of a thorough analysis uh, to determine exactly what Libra is and how it would be regulated. But at this point, we haven't come to any firm conclusions. At least I can speak from the CFTC. Uh, so uh, is there a way to describe the existing crypto regulation in a simple way? It seems still very murky. It, it is. It, it's, it, the analysis, I think, can be somewhat challenging. But ultimately, the question is, is it a security, first and foremost? And if it's not a security, it is most likely a commodity. And so that is the initial sort of test. What I will say is the interesting thing, unlike other kinds of investment contracts, is a digital asset can transform itself throughout time. So you can have a situation where something in an initial coin offering is very much a security. But over time, the system becomes more and more decentralized. Mm. Uh, the enterprise that originally sort of sponsored the currency is no longer in the fore. The thing is sort of running itself. There's an intangible uh, value you know, that's there. So you can have things that actually switch back and forth. You could also imagine a scenario where something is very much decentralized. But then all of a sudden, you know, there's a pullback. Uh, the, the company gets more 
involved in it, it starts to look more like a common enterprise where profits are derived from the activity of others, thereby meeting the Howey test. But I think all things being equal, if you, if you approach it as, is this a security? And if you come to the conclusion it's not with the SEC, uh, it's most likely going to be a commodity. Well, and you're definitely trying to add certainty to the market with some of your announcements today. Absolutely. But do you worry that the, the uncertainty surrounding Bitcoin and crypto regulation could stifle innovation in the space? Because maybe Libra doesn't get the green light because no one really knows what to do with it. I think we want to move with all deliberate speed in making determinations. Uh, that said, we have to take our time to make sure we get it right. Because if we, if we get something wrong and we put it in the wrong regulatory classification, uh, when there are investor protection interests and other things at stake, then we could lead to a situation where we don't have something that's properly regulated. But all things being equal, uh, one of the things that I care a lot about is making sure our markets have the cer certainty they need. And just on Libra, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg will be testifying on Capitol Hill later this month on Libra. So perhaps we'll hear more from, from him on, on kind of what their plans are with that. You also have something called Lab CFTC. Explain what that is and, and kind of the criteria for that. To, to the point that you made before about how the, the agency really needs to understand these markets and how myself, even I have a, I have a finance background, a, a regulatory background, but this area, I'm continuing to learn new things every day. Lab CFTC is set up to essentially address that potential gulf between uh, a Washington regulator that has historically focused on commodity markets that are very different from digital assets agriculture, energy, as well as financial futures, um, and also be a link to Silicon Valley, to other areas in this country, and many of you out there in the audience who are working on these, these types of new solutions. So Lab CFTC is in many ways a place where people can come and get to know about the CFTC regulated world, but we're speaking the same language. And so I'm pleased to announce today, actually, we have a new director of Lab CFTC, Melissa Netram, and she comes from Intuit. And so this is part of my philosophy is that you can't really be a good regulator unless you're hiring people in who actually know and understand these markets. So Intuit's obviously a Silicon Valley based company uh, and, and, and she has a strong background in this area, in digital assets, in FinTech in particular. And I would encourage all of you, if you're interested in learning about our regulatory framework, Lab CFTC is sort of a starting point. Well, and you also hired Dorothy DeWitt from Coinbase a few weeks ago. Yes, absolutely. And Dorothy, of course, has a has a has a very deep background in uh, derivatives markets, uh, derivatives markets, including. But her last stint, of course, was at Coinbase, and I thought that was uh, an exceptional background to have as our director of market regulation, because that is the division of the CFTC that actually oversees the exchanges. Mm. I want to move on away from crypto and talk about some of the other areas that you watch, most notably financial regulation. You just made some revisions to the Volcker rule, which limited and prohibited proprietary trading. That was one of the causes of the financial crisis, many experts agree. You call the Volcker rule the most well-intentioned but poorly designed regulation in the history of American finance. Th or one of them, at least. One of them. Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty harsh. I mean, what, what was the It is. And so about? I've lived with the Volcker Rule for a decade now. I was the original staffer on the Senate Banking Committee at the time when we had Chairman Volcker come up. And one of the things I said in my, in, in my statement was is that this was very well intentioned. I think the idea that uh, certain banks should not engage in non-banking activities if they're subject to the discount window, if, if they have access to the discount window, if they have FDIC deposit insurance, sort of it makes sense that an intuitive level. But when you looked at the Volcker Rule, there were about a thousand pages of regulations that I went through uh, and, and had, had many clients have to figure out what they were, and it was very difficult to make any sense out of it. I told a story once that I was in Australia, and I met a gentleman who was with a local bank in Australia, and he handed me his business card, and it said, Head of Volcker Rule Compliance. <laughs> so literally, in Australia, uh, this is something that, that we not only have done this in the United States, but around the world. Major problem was that the Volcker Rule was really intended to affect, I think, a very small subgroup of banks, money center banks that were engaging in proprietary trading, but it effectively applied to community and regional banks. So do you uh, have someone on your staff with Volcker Rule in their title? <laughs> we do not. Okay. We do not. That was something that, no. but. Uh, 
Yes. But still, I mean. So we fixed it. I, the Volcker rule still applies. The ultimate prohibition, the statute obviously is the law, but it applies in a way that, that I think is a lot more thoughtful and streamlined. And the Fed just this week approved it. It'll go into Absolutely. effect next year. But so this Fed, is five regulators that approved it. Fed Governor Lael Brainard did dissent. Uh, do you have any reaction to, to some of her problems with, with it? I, I haven't read her dissent. I, I think very highly of Governor Brainerd because we were colleagues on the FSB together. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are differences in views, but I think ultimately it's a recalibration of the Volcker Rule. It's not a revocation of the Volcker Rule. Yeah, she says it weakens the core protections against speculative trading. Yeah, and, and so, so I, I, I disagree. Um, I, I didn't see it that way. Um, I, think it, I think it continues to have a Volcker rule that is meant to do what it does, but I think it makes it uh, the compliance burden, particularly on the smaller financial institutions, is alleviated. All right, and if you didn't have enough on your plate, you're also watching Brexit as it relates to the Absolutely. clearing of derivatives, much of which takes place in London. What are some of the measures you've been taking in the, in the event of a no-deal Brexit? Absolutely. So first and foremost, I think we have an interest in ensuring there's no financial stability risk that arises in the event of a no-deal Brexit. The good news is, is we've been working very closely with our European counterparts and our UK counterparts on this point. So as an agency, we've done a year's worth of work essentially replicating any and all agreements that we have with the Europeans that would apply to the UK. Uh, we've, we've essentially replicated those to ensure that if it breaks away, uh, the UK still has all the same regulatory protections that companies did when they were under the EU. The other thing we're doing is encouraging for clearinghouses in particular to have uh, equivalents. So if there is a hard break, we don't see a situation where clearing members of large clearinghouses in London are forced out uh, en masse. So we've worked on that as well, and that extension has been granted. Do you see any type of systemic risk across the market if we do see chaos in the derivatives market from a no-deal Brexit? No, no. my hope is I, I, not at this time, not at this time. I think from a systemic risk point, we, 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 are, we are comfortable that uh, both the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, and all the other relevant regulators are, are addressing at it, looking at it closely. There could, of course, be some volatility. Uh, prices could move, but as far as the system itself, having those safeguards in place, I think we're pretty confident there. And you, of course, just started as CFTC chair a few months ago. That's right. Uh, what is it like as a regulator to work with the Trump administration? I guess, how does that relationship play out? It's fine. I mean, it's been, it, it, we, we haven't really had uh, too much interaction. I mean, the CFTC has its regulatory ambit, and we're focused on that. We do work a lot with the other regulators, so they are, they are uh, appointed by the administration. But I, I, it has been a, a very fruitful working relationship. And of course, the main um, part of the administration that, that works in the financial space is the Treasury Department. So having come from the Treasury Department myself, I was Assistant Secretary acting undersecretary. I know the Treasury Department quite well, and we've had a very constructive relationship. Well, just on the, on the notion of, of regulation, I mean, of course, Senator Elizabeth Warren is rising in the polls. She has a strong background in financial regulation. What do you make of, of, of her rise and I guess the appetite potentially to have someone as president who comes from that kind of background? Yeah, well, well I, I've had the, uh, the I've met with uh, Senator Warren a number of times. We've talked about issues mainly in my in my Treasury capacity. Um, we shall see. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I have to focus on is financial regulation. Uh, I have a lot on my plate. So the presidential election and all of the lead up to it is something that I'm not paying as much attention to at this point. I'm focused on my work, but uh, we shall see. Well, and, and I just wanted to end with getting a couple more of your goals. Yeah. As CFTC chair, I mean, we covered a lot, but what is the one thing you really want to accomplish during you know, the, the remaining three or four years of your term? Well, one of the things I like to say is the CFTC, now this is a very sophisticated audience, obviously, so you've heard of the CFTC, but for most Americans, the CFTC is arguably the most important financial regulator you've never heard of. Um, so one of the things I want to do is make sure that we are really focused on the benefits of derivatives to all America to all Americans. So one of the things you'll see me doing is focusing particularly on end users. So these are the manufacturers, the farmers, the ranchers, uh, the commercial companies, many of yours, that rely on derivatives to manage your risk. I think a lot has been focused on derivatives trading and Wall Street, we've dealt with that, but have we really made sure these markets are working for the people that they were ultimately designed for? So that's a, that's a key goal and you're gonna see that as part of my chairmanship. All right, well, Heath, we're really happy to have you here. Thank you for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.